Welcome to South Mr. Presbyterian Church and welcome to this time of worship. As we gather in this morning, please take a moment, pass the friendship pad down each pew, that way we have a record of you being here with us today. We have just a few announcements I want to make before we begin our worship service. One is, you'll notice all the signs in the hallway, we're getting ready for our new pictorial directory. Uh, the, the great news is we filled up all the time slots for the photographers. The even better news, because I know some of you are looking very concerned right now, is they're adding a third photographer. And so there are 13 more slots opened up, but you need to call the office or you need to call Evelyn quickly, quickly, quickly. And she also could use a little help. Uh, people, uh, as they come in, we're going to have a couple volunteers to help guide folks to the photographers to make sure that's a good uh, uh Good flow, good process there. So please, if you can help any of those times, please let Evelyn know. She would really, really appreciate your help. Uh, one bit of news about Bill Christian. Uh, many of you have been asking questions this morning. Uh, Bill was taken to the emergency room yesterday uh, where he is at UAB. He's been admitted. He's going to stay there. Uh, almost certainly until Thursday at least where he will begin uh, chemotherapy treatment. Uh, the family's asked for no visitors right now. Uh, we will try to keep you up to date with everything that we know as we can release that and as we can um, share that with you. Please keep Bill and the entire family in your prayers. This is going to be a very difficult process. So please keep them in your prayers. And a follow-up from last week, uh, Ashley's father had surgery, successful surgery, and doing really well, released from the hospital, and back home doing, uh, doing real well. So, are there any other announcements that need to be made today? Can I make a quick yes, absolutely. Uh, today, Church Patrick and I serve on the leadership of the church that helps with fundraising, and if you notice the bulletin today about the church, Yes, that's it. Yeah. Very good. Yes, homemade ice cream Wednesday night. If you'd like to bring something, let Mark know. We'd really appreciate it. Are there any other announcements? Let us join in a word of prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this new day, for the many blessings that we have in the living of it. We ask you to bless this time that we have. Block out the distractions of the world, that we may have a moment to hear your word, to listen to your spirit, to feel your call to discipleship once more. Lord, bless this time that we have as we seek to serve you in all that we do. For it's in Christ's name we make our prayer. Amen.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. You are the one for whom we search, O oh God. You are the hope for which we yearn, O oh Christ. You are the peace which can calm us, Holy Spirit. We say we know you and what you hope for us, but our words and actions, our silences and failures to care, show that we have so much to discover about our God. Let us gather up our foolish lives and offer them in prayer to the one who longs to forgive us and save us from ourselves. O oh God, if we are to speak truth in these moments, we must admit that we are not very gracious folks with our words or with our actions. We choose enough to hold grace, not to choose grace to those who hurt us. We choose enough to get into arguments with others rather than on the paths of peace. We choose enough to pour out bitterness to those around us who grieve rather than full cups of love. Forgive us, merciful God, so we might live in love as your children. May the grace which was in Jesus fill us with grace. May the hope which was in Jesus fill us with hope. May the life which was in Jesus fill us with love. May Jesus fill your heart to us. May we be your heart to those who love us. We should pray. When we love others, we imitate God. When we help others, 
we imitate God. When we offer mercy to others, we imitate God. May others continue to see God in us, even as we are loved, helped, and forgiven by our God. We see God's grace in the eyes of a child. We taste God's goodness in a meal with friends. We live God's peace when we offer justice as a sacrifice for others. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. peace of Christ has been extended to you this day, I invite you to share that same peace with your neighbor. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us pray for illumination. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Our first reading today is Psalm 8. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouths of babes and infants. You have found it a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The word of the Lord.
today's a little different. I'm not going to just invite the children to come forward for our children's sermon. I'm going to invite all of you who are gearing up for a new school year. That means students and teachers and administrators and volunteers and all of you who are getting ready for this next school year. Come forward. Come on. Come on. Come on. I see a couple teachers who are not coming forward. I still see some teachers who are not coming forward. Come and gather up. Come and gather in. Get as close as you can, okay? All right. It's good. All right, looking good, very good. You know that there is not a place that we can go where God is not already at work. There is not a single place you will ever be where you will not know that God is already there. With that said, soon for some of you, already for some others of you, school is starting. It is a new year. New adventures, new fun, new hard work, right? And it is appropriate and good for us to pause to ask God's blessing upon that time and upon us as we get ready to dive back into those history books, into that science and math when we go to the library, when we go, math, I know, right? Math. When we read poems, when we act out, when we sing loud, when we paint beautiful things, all the different ways that we continue to learn, I hope this year is a wonderful year for all of you. But now we're going to pause to ask God's blessing upon us. Got your backpacks? If you don't have your backpacks, do you have something that will remind you that God goes with you today? You do have your backpack. It looks great. I have my backpack too. All right. Let us pray. God of wisdom, we give you thanks for schools, for classrooms, for teachers, and students to fill them. We thank you for kids. Thank you. We thank you for this new beginning, for new books and new ideas. We thank you for sharpened pencils and pointy crayons and crisp blank pages waiting to be filled. We thank you for the gift of making mistakes and trying again. Help us to remember that asking the right questions is often as important as giving the right answers. Today we give you thanks for these, your children. We ask you to bless them with curiosity, understanding, and respect. May their backpacks be assigned to them that they have everything they need to learn and grow this year in school and in Sunday school. May they be guided by your love. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, who was a child in the temple, we showed lifelong learning was important. As an adult, he taught us and gave us great examples of your love. We thank you for all of these things. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Hey, bud. Thank you all, and I hope you have a wonderful school year. for Sunday school. We have an amazing Sunday school. If you were here this morning, you saw just incredible things. Seven adult classes, classes for all the different age groups of children. There's a place for you. 
Here's the thing. There are no grades in Sunday school. You don't have to worry about that math question that you just couldn't get. Or learning that poem. Or writing that essay. You can come and join in the conversation. And be a full participant in a Sunday school class. And grow in learning your faith. Always. So, I hope I see you all next week in Sunday school. Several years ago, uh, a member of my previous church asked me if it was hard to preach those difficult texts. You know what I mean? There are some texts throughout Scripture that are a certain kind of challenge. But I've never really thought that was the hardest to preach. The hardest texts to preach are the ones that you already know the ones that you already love. Speaking of that, today we come to Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. A scripture reading that you know. And I imagine a scripture reading that you love. And I hope by the end of the sermon you'll understand why I find this to be more of a challenge than some of those other texts. Hear now a word from the Lord. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock, you are our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. There are few Bible stories that we romanticize as much as this one. In our minds, we might picture the perfect children's sermon. That that sign of perfection, that best way to possibly do it. But in my mind, as I read this text, I can't help but think of that picture that was in the Sunday school classroom that I grew up in in Leland, Mississippi. You've seen the picture, right? The picture of this scene where Jesus sits on a rock and there's a nearby tree that offers just a little bit of shade and there's that child sitting in his lap and all the others have gathered around nice and quiet. We can romanticize a moment, can't we, church? They're all smiling. They're all paying attention. They're all paying attention. They're nice and kept. You've seen this picture, right? With its vibrant colors, simple beauty, this idyllic moment of the perfect children's sermon in front of Jesus. I think... That artist from the 1940s was just a little bit optimistic. Or he hadn't spent a whole lot of time with children. Or perhaps had never seen the reality of a Southminster children's sermon. Maybe they'd forgotten the anxiety and the boundless exuberance of children as they seek to do something new. I thought about this a lot myself this last week, and I wondered what this picture would have been like if Norman Rockwell would have painted it. Can you imagine the scene? I bet it would have 
been a little different than that image that hung on the wall in my Sunday school classroom. A little less ideal. A moment captured that would offer just a little bit more reality. The reality when the disciples give their hesitation at the rugged clothes or the unkept hair, the faces of wonder and the faces of distraction. The disciples who knew exactly what was going to happen, that there would be a fight. Someone would squabble over who got to sit in Jesus' lap. After all, the disciples know this all too well. They had just been fighting over who gets to sit beside him. So why wouldn't the little children offer the same? Maybe there in the corner is that mischievous prankster that Norman Rockwell knows so well, eyeing the ponytail to pull right in front of him. The reality of joy and the reality of hardship, the bouncing energy, the careful study, and the enchanting smile that only a child of the children sermon. But lest we not forget those standing in the corner the fearful parents with hopeful tears and sharp correcting eyes, reassuring comfort and breath-holding anxiety, hoping that the child does not say anything or do anything unwanted or unrehearsed. Can you imagine the horror of a parent with a child in front of Jesus when he says, Mom didn't say her prayers last night. <laughs> or when she offers, Dad yelled at the TV yesterday at the ball game. Yes, I imagine Rockwell would have added those nervous parents in as well. Is there a more romanticized moment? Even if we take this reality check with Norman Rockwell, we're still adding this romanticism to a moment captured in Scripture that is less than ideal. We are adding in our own assumption of what the children's sermon may have looked like. But we must remember, Jesus is not speaking to the children. He is speaking to the adults. Jesus declares that the children come and in a moment he will re reverse all of our understanding and notions of faith. It is important to understand what Jesus is doing at this moment. What has just taken place as he affirms the children. Jesus was traveling south. He was leaving his homeland, the place of his childhood, and he was heading to the place of his death. He was heading south to Jerusalem, and all along the way, every bit of the road was taken up by the Pharisees, who hounded his every step, accosting him every time he took a break. Now the scene immediately before our text today are the Pharisees trying to ask Jesus to trip him up once more about the law. In this, they pull out the law about divorce. They are doing what they always do. They are circumventing relationship and setting it in the course of rules. They are making a line in the sand and seeing what they can get away with and what is not prohibited. Jesus will not fall for this trap again. Again, he takes their words about law and order and he turns it upside down and reorients it with children sitting in his lap. Jesus bends the discussion concerning the law into a call for justice. You see, the law of Moses has now been handed down to a group that only sees the law. 
They care not for any relationship with God. The law is what guides them in everything that they do. And now they want to know about divorce. They want to know what they can do and what they can get away with. Jesus says that this is about more. This is about justice in our time. Namely, men with all the power are now using the laws of Moses against women and children who have little or no power. This has been well documented by historians and anthropologists of what the laws were like in this time of who had the power to declare a divorce and under what ground. The law that the Pharisees are asking about is a law that is unjust in its time. It is not the same that we have today with laws and protection. What they're asking is, can I just leave my wife to her own devices? Can I just get rid of my children and let them grow up in poverty? Will God still bless that? And Jesus says, no. Even though there is a law, and even though you can take advantage of that law, that is not what God has in mind. Jesus declares that the use of the law is unjust in this time. And it is hurtful to the most vulnerable people in society, condemning them to the practice of lawful things, not of godly things. And in a movement seemingly crafted to reinforce God's call to justice and reaffirming the least of these among them, the children come. And Jesus lifts them up. In a world that paid very little attention to children, Jesus calls them to his side. In a world that saw them as a nuisance that needed to be shooed away, Jesus touches and blesses each of them, saying to all who had ears to hear that this is the righteousness that God seeks. The exuberance of the wiggle worm, the trust of the innocent, the wonder of the quisitive. It is in the very face of, in a direct contradiction to, the power and the corrupted faith of the Pharisees that Jesus invites children with a stern rebuke of his own disciples who are finding that the easier path. You know, keep them away. Follow the rules. Jesus demonstrates what justice will look like when we trust and have relationship with God and not simply have a relationship with the law. It is a reversal as big as the Beatitudes, where meek inherit the earth, where the persecuted are blessed, where the hungry are filled, and in the vision of hope of the kingdom of God, where the last will be first and the first will be last, Jesus picks up those who want attention, not law. Jesus touches those who seek relationship and not just a rule. Jesus, by word and action, does not offer us a children's sermon to be romanticized today, but a disciple sermon with a sharp critique of our society, a message that subverts our assumptions. In our world, Norman Rockwell and all, who would it be who would come before the disciple asking for a moment of Jesus' time? Who would they shoo away? Who would we put up barriers in front of? Who do the rules marginalize the most? Who have the powerful kept out of the reach of justice, of mercy, of wholeness? of the touch of Christ. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. What a great word. Can you imagine Jesus indignant? I hope that you can. Because he was. 
when it came to those things that were unjust. Let them come to me, he said. Do not stop them. Do not stand in their way. He gathers them in his arms. He laid hands on them and he blessed them. Who is it? Who are they in our society? What critique does the church need to hear? What roles need to be overturned? Jesus turns to the adults in the room. Those with the power in the room. Those with the rules benefiting them in the room. And says, your salvation is wrapped up in this very moment. And it's not anything to do with the rules not anything to do with your power. We do not move to be childlike without purpose. It is to be intertwined completely with purpose and intentionality. To become childlike in our faith is to move toward justice in the world full of justification for unjust behavior. Jesus invites us to identify but the ones that we would reject. Do you hear that? We become them to see through their eyes of wonder and innocence, longing for acceptance, longing for physical contact, and longing for blessing. In a safe space to grow, not simply up, but to grow deeply in faith. When Christ calls the children to come, let us dream, let us dare, even as we are, to seek out justice for all of God's children. And not just settle for a romanticized version of it. Amen. Let us pray. My God, it seems so easy. So straightforward, so black and white. The rules are there. And yet you call us to a life that is a completion to the law, not the law itself. You call us into relationship and deep kindness that leads to justice and peace and hope for all those that would be pushed aside. Change in us today our hearts that seek to fall back on the law as the end of your message to us. That seek to follow the simple ways of making lines, drawing boxes, building walls. And call us into deeper relationship with all of your children. That we may hear what Christ has to say even as he becomes indignant at our actions. Lord, we ask you to be with all of those this day that mourn, all those who have suffered loss, all those who are anxious, all those who seek comfort. Today especially, we ask you to be with, with Bill, Patty, children, We ask you to be with the doctors and nurses who will extend care. We ask you to be with Patty and Ann and Barbara as their health 
improves. Be with Jean as she recovers and Jack as well. Be with Al this day and all days in the loss of his mother. And the rest of the family who gather around and support him even in their own grief. Be with Joe and Jim and Lori. With Bob, and Jeremy, as they seek answers for difficult questions, as they seek healing, even in the face of loss. Lord, we pray you be with all of them and all those who are left on our hearts this day. And hear us now as we lift our voices together in the prayer your Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today we have heard the word proclaimed and we have the opportunity now before us to say what we believe. Today our affirmation of faith is taken from the Confession of 1967. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what is it that you believe? In life, death, resurrection, and promise coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His life involves the church in the common life of all people. His service to humanity commits the church to work for every form of human well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all the sufferings of humankind so that it sees the face of Christ in our faces in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the church God's judgment on humanity's inhumanity, and the awful consequences of its own complicity and injustice. In the power of the risen Christ and the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise of God's renewal of humanity's life in society and of God's victory over all wrong. Amen. Please be seated. Today, we have the opportunity to give as we have received. Today, we have the moment to live out a life with purpose, signal to society and even in our own family that we will seek justice.
for all people. Today, let us give, as we have been given, our tithe and our offering. ask you to receive these gifts as we recommit our very lives to you. May we seek out forms of justice for all people, that we may bring them before Christ, not retain the barriers that keep them away, that we may seek out Christ's touch in our own lives, and that we may offer that same touch to others, touch of peace, love, of comfort, and of hope. We ask you to bless these gifts and multiply them as they will be used. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Jesus became indignant when the disciples held the children back. Let us never be put in that same position. Whoever the children are in your life, whoever need that touch of grace, whoever need that word of kindness, whoever need to be brought into the very presence of Christ, offer that to them. Go now, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three in one this day and forevermore, go in peace. Amen. Thank you.